Okay, I'll try to keep to five minutes. Uh, my name is Mohamed Abdinur. I work for USAID Ethiopia. And I'm going to just give you a quick highlight about this book called uh, Resilience in Action, uh, The Changing Horizons in the Drylands. You can pick a copy from the book outside right here on the USAID. And I would like to thank and acknowledge all the USAID partners who work in the drylands. And I can see Dominic here of Masico. Uh, so just, just quickly, you know, USAID has been working in the drylands of Ethiopia for a, quite some time. And before even the words resilience came into the picture, but uh, we have a lot of experience and a lot of our work is, comes from the 2000 drought in, uh, in Ethiopia. I think in the Horn of Africa, we had so many droughts, uh, 92, 97, 2000, 2006, and then 2011 was a big one that caught everybody's attention. But in 2000, there was a big drought in, uh, in Somalia region, in Gode. Around 300,000 children died because of malnourish malnutrition. So at that time, USAID initiated through a program, the Farming Funds, it's a USAID Washington mechanism, to really develop a long-term interventions in these areas. So as a result of that effort, then we were able to design and develop a new program called Pastoralist Library Initiative. So since then, USAID has been implementing a couple of activities and including some of the innovations like uh, the crisis modifier that yesterday was highlighted as one of the best practices that's able to link humanitarian and development. However, in terms of our experience, one of the things we like to do always is evidence-based. And we contracted uh, Tufts University in Ethiopia to be able to do some interventions that are cost effective, they do impact assessments, and a lot of it is building on evidence. And so based on the analysis, we came up with our own strategy, which is uh, you have two prong pastoralists now, you find more successful pastoralists who are involved in livestock marketing, livestock trade, they are viable, they are more kind of a market oriented, they have large herds of animals. Then you have another group of pastoralists that are dropping out, and those ones we call them the tops transitioning out of pastoralism. So our interventions revolve around these two main groups of livelihoods, trying to define and support them. And I think our, our key experience working in the drylands is uh, one message I want to share is there's no one single intervention that's going to address communities' resilience. You need a menu of interventions. You need a couple of, as my friend was saying, bundle of interventions. I say bundle of uh, resilience interventions. For example, conflict is one of the big drivers that people don't talk about it. But if you have conflict in an area, then you disrupt communities, uh, rangeland management, they don't get access to water, they don't get access to markets and all that stuff. So there's so many interventions that need to happen either independently or jointly to be able to address resilience. So there are, support, there are a couple of examples in the book you can refer to. The other one is the private sector. Uh, you know, when people talk about private sector in the drylands, we're not talking about DuPont or Nestle or the big guys. We're talking about small businesses that really play a critical service in these communities. For example, the Community Animal Health Service Delivery in Ethiopia has been tested, tried, and implemented. And you have a couple of private pharmacies or drug dealers that are linked to private pharmacies and community animal health workers that are delivering drugs and services to a wide range of communities. Then financial services is an area which is not well developed, but it's coming up. And, and our, aid, our area of interest is uh, Islamic finance. Uh, we're working with a couple of microfinance institutions, especially in the Somali region, that we're helping them develop financial products that are relevant to these communities. The other one is uh, the issue of uh, innovation and technology. I think uh, in these areas, yesterday is the GPR, there was a lot of talk about innovations, what type of innovations. I think we're using, one example we're using very well right now is the remote sensing technology that's satellite based, that the US Geological Service and a private company are able to provide to us 
you know, real-time information and tell us where are the areas where there are potential points for water drilling. So you can use the technology to help reduce the time and the interventions you do traditional uh, water, water monitoring. And the other one I wanted to talk about is the issue of humanitarian and development. Uh, Ethiopia, as I said, we've been very fortunate in USAID in trying to link the humanitarian aspects. You know USAID has different offices. We have the Office for Foreign Disaster Assistance and our development office. In terms of working together and breaking the barriers that really divide the humanitarian and development. One example is a crisis modifier. It's a very flexible mechanism which the long-term program has an inbuilt mechanism. In the event of a drought in this area, then our implementing partners on the ground can really change gears. If there's a drought, then you can do drought interventions, but within the long-term context of resilience. Okay. You know, a pastoralist, you need 10 days to talk about something. So I'll cut short, but I think the, you can really read the book. It's out there. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thanks.